So welcome to the civil blasting episode of the International Society of Explosive Engineers web series, Explosives Every Day. My name's Alistair Torrance, and I'm the president of the International Society of Explosive Engineers. Our organization started in 1974 when a group of like-minded people got together in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to discuss how to better apply commercial explosives and how to champion the blaster in the field. Move forward to today and we're an international organization with more than 4,000 members spread over 90 countries with a mission to advance the science and art of explosive engineering worldwide. We do this through sharing our knowledge and providing training and education for everyone involved with blasting. We also have a strong education foundation and have awarded more than $1 million in scholarships to our students in our industry. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our series partners, Dino Nobel, Opit Blast and LDE Global. This series would not have been possible without their tremendous support. So this episode showcases civil blasting and things that are happening in and around our communities every day. It also gives some interesting insights into how some of our presenters got into the industry at a very early age. This session is sponsored by Daikon Blasting Corporation. Daikon Blasting is a precision drilling and blasting company specializing in the application of high explosives for controlled blasting for the excavation of rock and reinforced concrete on both land and water. So the presenters for this segment are Jared Redike of Daikon Blasting Corporation, Brian Lewis of Respect, and Christy Bishop from HTA. So Jared Redike is president of Daikon Blasting Corporation. He's worked in the blasting industry since 1989 and has a wealth of experience in precision controlled rock blasting, trenching, tunneling, quarry blasting, building implosions, smokestacks, bridges and other industrial structures. In this segment, he's going to talk about rock drilling and blasting for pipelines, renewable energy and site work. So Brian Lewis is a senior drill and blast specialist with Respect's Explosive Engineering Group. He's been in the industry for more than 28 years and his focus has been primarily on construction blasting and quarry and coal blasting. As an aside, he's president of the Kentucky Bluegrass chapter of the ISCE and is a board member, member of the Kentucky Blasting Conference. So Brian's gonna to touch on drilling and blasting for civil roadways, buildings, schools, subdivisions, and the US Army Corps of Engineers projects. So Christy Ellen Bishop began working summers while in school and she learned the fundamentals of blasting from the field operations, shadowing her mother, co-owner of HDA Enterprises Incorporated. She now works with HDA as a project manager and she manages the marketing and the sale and distribution of explosives. She's a member of both Kentucky Bluegrass chapter and the International Society of Explosive Engineers, and she's a valuable board member of the IACE. So Christy will discuss rock drilling and blasting for civil tunnel approaches and with utilities in municipalities. It's going to be a question and answer session with the presenters right after this presentation. The panel will discuss many questions that were asked by a live audience at the time of this episode's first airing. Okay, let's sit back and relax and find out how explosives are used in civil applications. I'm Jared Redike, president of Daikon Blasting Corp. My day-to-day -day activities include overseeing all of the company's operations. Daikon Blasting is a full-service rock drilling and blasting contractor, and we specialize in close-in blasting for pipelines, utilities, site development, road jobs, etc. 
We take on projects all over the country. I was born into the explosive business. My father owns a company that does explosive demolition. So I have been hands-on with explosives from a very early age. I work for my dad's company during summers and holidays from about the age of 12. After receiving a degree in business administration and construction management, I went to work full-time for my father's demolition company. In 1997, I formed Daikon Blasting to concentrate on the rock blasting market. In most situations, explosives are still the cheapest and quickest method to break up or remove rock. We have a saying, you can break rock with iron or chemicals. Chemicals or explosives may not seem like the cheapest method at first, but usually it proves to be the cheapest method in the long run. There is a myriad of things that go into planning and executing a successful blast. There are hours or even weeks that can go into planning a blast that can last two seconds or less. The geology and composition of the rock, how much overburden is on top of the rock, distance to the nearest house or occupied dwelling, age and type of the structure, presence of underground utilities, regulatory limitations on vibrations at the nearest structures or utilities, types of materials the utilities are made of, internal operating pressures of those utilities, depth of burial in relationship to the elevation of your boreholes, the type of blasting that you're conducting, i.e. mass rock or trench, the equipment type that the contractor is going to use to excavate the blasted rock, presence of water in the boreholes, the type of explosives that are available in the area, meaning packaged or bulk. All of these factors must be considered when planning a successful blast. To make this happen, we need a lot of coordination from our blasting crews, as well as the support of the contractor we are working for. Execution of the plan from each crew member is what makes a successful blast. None of the steps can be neglected. After a plan has been developed, it must be implemented in the field. A proper and safe working area must be prepared. The blasting crew can then lay out the holes at the exact locations and distances as designed. The drillers must then drill the holes to the correct depth and inclination, paying attention to the geology. They must in turn document the hole conditions and any anomalies such as mud seams or voids. Once the explosives are loaded, the holes will be stemmed by adding crushed washed rock to lock in the explosive energy into each hole. If neglected or not done properly, fly rock and excessive air blast can occur. Every step of the process is critical. We have a saying in our company, every hole, every time. No hole is unimportant. Paying attention to all of the details, it's what separates good blasters from the mediocre blasters. We are far removed from the John Wayne days of lighting a stick of dynamite with a cigar and throwing it over our shoulder and hoping for desirable results. Get some field experience. Go to work for someone where you can learn and understand the process. Even if you pursue a degree in explosives through one of the mining engineering schools, good practical field experience is invaluable. There will always be a need for the use of explosives in the civil arena to break rock. Urban sprawl and development means that projects will continue to get closer to existing structures. This will require that blasters hone their craft and can blast in a safe and efficient manner without causing any impacts to the surrounding community. I'm Brian Lewis, Senior Drum Blast Specialist with Explosive Media Unit Group of Respec. Before coming to Breezepec, I uh, spent 28 plus years uh, with a family drill and blast company, Bedrock, out of Lexington, Kentucky. And we did civil blasting across four states. I did a lot of uh, enclosed shooting, uh, downtowns, residential, right up against houses. That was our niche in the market. 
I am a third generation blaster. My grandfather was a blaster. My dad was a blaster. And so I became a blaster. Coming from the uh, Eastern Kentucky coal mines at that time, it was a very credible and well-paying job. Uh, I started very young in the blasting industry. Uh, I remember sitting on my dad's lap when I was uh, very young, riding up those mountains on a dozer. I uh, started in reclamation work. And this is long before, the world was a different place back then. And, and I can remember driving across the job site and I was driving, uh, I was about 12, and I'd take the truck across. And, and then I started with a shovel and I worked my way up. I, uh, I worked summers in co-op in my senior year, which I was in high school. I uh, obtained a business degree, business uh, management from the University of Louisville. And, uh, you know, with the last thing, I just started in the, at the bottom of the ranks. I started with a shovel uh, and I went to, uh, I made the labor and a packing powder. And I made, uh, learned to run around a drill and became a driller. And then I became a blaster. And I became uh, running a crew and I became lead blaster. And I became a uh, uh, lead blaster project manager. And I actually ran the whole entire company for the last several years. The reason we still use explosives and civil blasting today is um, anytime that construction occurs, excavation has to happen. Excavation is digging in the ground and all across the country in certain areas, uh, bedrock is encountered. So the safest, most cost efficient and effective way to remove that rock, if there's any quantity to it at all, is by blasting. Another reason for it is if you, you can take a job and not allow blasting and the price of that project will rise exponentially, which of course take, uh, costs the taxpayers money. Whereas if you actually include blasting, it'll drop the price significantly, which saves money. Everything I've done, everything I designed, all the projects I've been on, you can see a lot of them during the video here. Everything is based around safety. Uh, personal safety comes first. The individuals on the blasting crew itself, because they're the closest to it. The individuals on the construction job, and then the surrounding individuals, uh, residential, that live or work around the project. And then property safety comes next. And so there's so many things to take into account. Yeah, I've, I have worked for hours, days, or as much as weeks on one blast that lasts less than two seconds. Nobody sees how much work really goes into that thing. Um, our industry is thread is through thre with safety. Uh, everything we do, the, the safety webinars, the retraining. Uh, I'm also president of state chapter, as I mentioned earlier, I think. So our, our main goal is retraining for the blasters. They have to have eight hours of retraining every single year. This just reinforces uh, the safety aspect. We're also highly regulated, very highly regulated, which the ones of us that are out here making a living and doing it the right way, uh, we want to do it right. We don't want to hurt anybody. We want everybody wanting to go home safe. To make all this happen, it takes a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, it starts with the design and the engineering side. Um, once it gets to the contractors, uh, adequate time to bid it and putting the proper money in so that we don't cut corners um, and do, this job, do the job properly. And then there's a lot of coordination with the contractors, uh, local officials. I've used the uh, police a lot, stopping traffic, pushing people back, especially in colleges and downtowns and highly traffic areas. To make a long story short, explosives are here to stay. They've been around since the beginning of time. Mining has been around since the, the Romans and, and the Egyptians and the Greeks. So without well, explosives and blasts, imagine a world without transportation, jet planes, railroads, communications, cell phones, radar, arts, jewelry, uh, buildings, skyscrapers, parking garages, driveways, blacktop roads, concrete, walls, drywall, we have to go back to living in the grass huts. And on the civil portion of this, uh, with the blasting, so when you're driving down the road and you go through a rock cut, if you've ever been through the mountains, a rock cut, and it's kind of cut sheer, that's called pre-splitting. Um, and those nice smooth roads that we drive on, that's called cut and fill. 
So we cut in the areas that need that are high and they put that material in the low that fill and make them a lot more even and steady. Um, we want to, for the expansion of, sub, of subdivisions, the way that the world is going, the way the housing market is going right now, all those are all going to require blasting. Municipalities are going to have to grow. They're going to have to, to, uh, to, to keep the influx of, of people coming into the cities. Every construction is not going to stop. It's just going to keep growing. And with that, there's going to come construction blasting. Um, I think there's going to be a need for a lot more experience. These newer generations coming in, they need to learn the, the ways that, that we learn from the very beginning, from the start, from the bottom up. That's the only way to properly know how to do it. So if you want to get into this, ed into this industry, uh, my recommendation would be, if you want to go get an education, get a mining degree or an explosive engineering degree, that's fine. But get some time on the bench. Get out there with a shovel and spend time. I don't mean six months, I just mean spend some time out there. See if this is really what you want. Early in my career, my dad pushed me to think and act outside my comfort zone, and I'm truly grateful for it. Today, I constantly try to think outside the box. I've always pushed myself to take projects outside my comfort zone and surround myself by the winners. I want to be better than I was yesterday. If yesterday's blast was good, today I want it to be better. The explosive industry has so many different opportunities, which has allowed me to constantly challenge myself and grow. This holds true for the upcoming generation as well. If you think explosive industry is for you, set your goals high and don't stop to achieve them. And if you do achieve them, set them higher. My name is Christy Bishop, and I'm the Vice President of HTA Enterprises. I run every daily operation, and I manage each individual project for HTA. My daily processes is that I usually am always looking for work. I take care of a lot of the bidding processes, submittals, and I also take care of the daily operations once we get the job. All the MOBs, DMOBs, scheduling crews, uh, deliveries, because we are also a distributor of explosive products. I actually grew up in the industry from day one. Um, I started going to work with my mom whenever I was about three years old on the weekends because she could not find babysitters. So I have actually grown up uh, doing this my entire life. Fun fact about Christy, I was almost born on a shot in Berea, Kentucky. My mom came into HTA um, a year and a half after it was incorporated. She started the blasting side of the company and she was sole operator for all the blasting and drilling operations and then she also was still bidding work and running the actual jobs being a driller and being a daily blaster all while also being a officer of the company she was my hero she taught me everything i knew from being a people person um, to help being a good leader to network to never burn your bridges best memory about mom it was our daily sacrifices for work. And then she'd still turn around, come home, was able to be a home mom, and then stay up all night and go back to work. And then turn around and do it all over again. I started out as a basic labor whenever I was about 10. Um, and then from then on, I moved on to be a driller and then eventually a blaster. I never ended up getting my blaster's license till later on in life because I didn't necessarily need it. Didn't really know if that's what I wanted. Didn't get my blaster's license till I was actually 20. Some of the coolest jobs I've ever done are tank pits, underwater drilling and blasting. 
I got to uh, live through some of the coolest projects in the local Louisville area. The Lock and Dams Rehabilitation Project, the Ohio, Ohio River Bridges Project in Prospect in Utica, Indiana. The Ohio River Bridges Project started in 2013 in Prospect, Kentucky. The project had been in the works for over 30 years. On the development side, there are several historical sites that were surrounding the project, and that's what held up the project for so many years. We were lucky enough to be the starters of this project, of actual the tunnel and uh, completing 265 all the way to Indiana. It was the second largest job in the nation at the time. Explosives are still used in civil blasting today in civil sites just because of the fact of the ease on contractors. Most of the utility lines that service homes, warehouses, and everything else lay within rock. It's actually a little bit more appeasing to neighbors to have blasting than it is hoe ramming because it's not a constant sound all day and it's not disruptive all day. It's just in the neighbors have warnings. Um, it's more productive on the site development. It's faster, cheaper, and it's actually safer for the neighbors in most aspects. If anybody wanted to start in this career and become an actual blaster or driller, learn to start at the bottom. Be a laborer first and work your way up. That way you know every aspect of everybody's job and you can be an efficient leader. Not only am I vice president of HTA and the director of everyday activities within our company, I am also on the board of directors for the International Society of Explosive Engineers. I sit in on the blasters training committee and also the driller section because that is my area of expertise. And I also help guide in proper trainings that we would provide as a society for our blasters. And they, everyone has always respected my opinion because I am a daily blaster and a daily driller. I also sit on the board for our local chapter of the Bluegrass chapter of the society. And there we all more work together and we provide two trainings a year to help our localized states yeah, for their blasters, you know, their retraining hours. The Bluegrass chapter also helps correlate with the UK student chapter of the ISEE. Uh, we just try to give them as much support as possible in the networking and helping them uh, create fundraisers. And the use of civil explosives is always going to be a necessity just because of the fact that they're the municipality structures will always have to be updated to be able to service the people. Another reason that the civil use of blasting activities will always have to commence is the decent land um, that would be developed is no longer accessible. Most of it is within rock and on hillsides and sites now have to be developed accordingly, which most of those consist of rock which required a blasting. It never ceases to amaze me how explosives can be used with such precision in such delicate operations to produce results in civil blasting. Now we're going to move on to our question and answer session with moderator Travis David Saber. Well, thanks Alistair, and thanks to our sponsors for their financial support. Without them, we would not be able to bring this free series to you. Uh, let's talk live with our panelists, Jared, who's in Oklahoma, and Brian and Christy in Kentucky, who are ready for your questions. Please send any questions via the question and answer box. Uh, the chat feature for this has been disabled. So please again, send them via the question and answer box. 
Uh, our first question this evening or morning or wherever you happen to be in the world right now is for Jared. And Jared, um, what uh, the question here is, how close can you blast to an in-service pipeline? Well, that's a good question, Travis. As you know, most of the pipeline uh, that are put in nowadays are not greenfield, meaning uh, they're not uh, in wide open spaces. They're paralleling existing lines. So the furthest we ever usually are is 50 feet. And then we blast as close as 20 feet to in-service high pressure lines on a daily basis. All right, that's pretty close, Jared. Uh, anything that you specifically do to ensure safety? Oh, there's a lot of things that go into uh, designing blasts when you're within the 20 foot parameter. So um, uh, we look at a lot of things, type of rock, um, how much overburden's on there, what type of explosives we're using. So yeah, there are tricks to the trade to, to, to keep the pipeline safe. All right, thanks, Jared. Um, our next question is for the entire panel. And uh, uh, the question comes uh, is, uh, what is the use of what looks like heavy carpets on the blast shots? Mm, blast and mats. Yeah, those are blast and mats. I'll jump in on that. Uh, some are site specific um, and we have to use them. Um, and then other times they're just literally for public safety and site safety. So they're Christy, what, exactly do those, what do those blasting mats do? They help contain um, any overburden material or anything that would go up. So the blasting mats that we use are usually about weigh about 6,000 pounds a piece. They're recycled rubber. And mm -hmm. uh, in certain situations, if we're close to a house or a roadway or something, and we don't, uh, we have a concern about uh, um, rock flying, then we'll place the mats on there. It, it helps muffle the sound and, and uh, make sure there's no fly rock. Yeah, anytime I'm in close quarters <clears throat> like that, um, someone was into my video, it shows, you know, I use blast mats just to be safe. It's just a, it's just a little bit extra <clears throat> precaution to take to protect the, everyone around us. All right, thanks. Our next question is from Eric, and it is, uh, what are the biggest challenges you face on a day-to-day -day basis in your operations? Daily changes, definitely. Daily challenges. Yeah, what are your daily challenges, Christy? Daily challenges, rock never stays the same in civil. Um, also, you're always moving, going down line, moving within the job site, and you're always having to monitor, change your blast plan, move forward, work with every other day, neighbors and uh, contractors and everybody else. And that's kind of the main things, keep everybody safe, but to get the job done productively. I guess, Brian and Jared, what challenges or what are your biggest challenges that you face? I would say that the regulatory uh, environment has changed a lot since I've been in the business. Uh, there's more and more regulations. Uh, we work all over the country, so staying up with the local and state regulations is big. Um, you know, they're ever changing. And like Christy said, um, you know, we're pipeline blasting and we're covering sometimes half a mile or a mile a day and the rock changes. So keeping up with, um, the hole to hole, uh, changes and the blasters being able to adapt to the geology and be able to custom load. Um, that's, that's big for success. Mm -hmm. That's a big one for me too, where I moved around so much, it was always changing. <clears throat> it was never the same from one place to the day. Yeah, definitely. You have to have a good team. You have to have good drillers. That can call the rock. Yet, what we call call the rock is top of rock uh, seams in this industry is what we you know a mud seam, a change in rock, um, and you know that driller will make your blaster look good or bad. So all that correlates together, and everybody's got to work as a team in this yeah. industry. Yeah, you can take a, a good drill and make a decent blaster look really good. Or you can take a bad drill and make a really good blast work really bad it's teamwork <clears throat> and also test shot early on when i move into an area like a small real small contained test shot to see what it's going to do see if it's going to break see if it's going to all my numbers and my maths are right so we'll make, make adjustments for getting any production going all right um our next question comes from george and as a young engineer uh, george asks or states that he's curious to know what types of entry-level jobs are out there uh, in explosives engineering and what type of specific titles of those jobs should they be searching for on job boards? 
Well, through the years, we've uh, had a lot of interns, um, usually through one of the schools of mine, uh, Roller particularly. We've had lots of people come through. And I think all three of us touched in our little segments about how important um, boots on the ground uh, experience is. You can learn in a classroom, but there is nothing like learning on the bench with a shovel in your hand, carrying bags and boxes and stem and buckets. Um, the, the classroom just doesn't teach you that. And just seeing lots of different applications and types of blasting that we do, you just got to get experience. So, uh, you know, a good summer internship with a, you know, depending on what type of blasting you want to do, that's what I would be looking for. Yeah, that's I think a good it, to start. Well, go ahead, Brian. But you know, it, it's, it's just everyday changes. You can't get this stuff out of a textbook. You can run these numbers and stuff, and it looks good on math when you put it on the ground and you actually pull that trigger and you're liable for everything and everybody around you. Because once you get that blaster license, you're liable. So that's a, that's the game changer there is, is doing it every day, you know, just getting out there and doing it every day. There's a, a there is a starting to be a small trend I'm starting to see in the construction side where more folks are starting to hit, uh, get some of them, bring more mining engineering kids in, but they're still starting them you know, learning the, learning to do it every day and load the shot and everything else, which is what needs to be done. I think this question is a little bit related uh, and it's a question for all of you. Uh, where can a person get a degree in drilling and blasting from? I know I'll start the, the, the question out there myself. I went to Michigan Technological University where I was between the civil engineering and mining engineering departments and, and got some uh, training in the university, but it compares nothing to what I learned out in the field, learning from folks like Christy and Brian and, and Jared on the bench or on the shot. Mm -hmm. There's only nine universities that I think is in the whole United States that actually teach either mining or explosives. Uh, Raw is a good one in Missouri, but it goes back to, you know, getting out there on the bench. That's your real education. Learn how to run a drill and read your rock and then start turning around and learn how to load it. I mean, that's where it's at. And there's, uh, there's quite a few programs around North America, um, uh, South Dakota School of Mines, uh, Virginia Tech. Kentucky. Um, Kentucky. Yeah, UK. Um, I looked it up one time. I think it's about nine total. I may be wrong on that, but I think it's about nine. There's, there's several programs around the, around the country, and I, I think a quick search of mining engineering programs is a great start. Um, most mining engineering programs have training uh, for blasting, but it doesn't replace that experience that you gained uh, by being out in the field working. Um, our next question is for Christy, and it's from uh, Magrath. Um, how do you prevent misfires or explosives malfunction when blasting underwater? You, knew, you use non-propagational materials and explosive materials. Um, we use non-L products uh, for detonators, and we use HIX, which is a non-propagational dynamite. That's a simple answer. Try not to get too technical on that and to jump in on that, a redundancy, um, usually underwater blasts are a one-shot deal. So multiple detonators, multiple boosters, just making yeah. sure you got backup uh, in case uh, you have a cap failure or something is always a good, a good idea when you're blasting underwater. Yes. Thank you, Jared. All right. Our next uh, question here comes from Timothy. Uh, he says, it seems like on the videos, there's a different color of surface on the blast area. Is this a surface pretreatment uh, or some form of dust abatement? A lot of that is a change in materials that we're in. Um, Jared was all over the country. Uh, we were localized in the Louisville area. Uh, Brian, he was kind of all over Kentucky. Um, kind of Brian, reiterate, but Lexington and well, I was all over Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, and Tennessee. But yeah. I've seen to get without getting into geology, I've seen rock come in white, blue, gray, orange. Um, got any other colors I can think of? <laughs> brown, <laughs> brown, yeah. like the dolomite on top. Yep, yep, brown. So, I mean, it's just it's just the different geology, and it could be a little bit of a camber. Some of mine were a little bit older, some of the Corps of Engineers, too. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was like a bluish gray shale down there. I think uh, it might be worth adding that I think some of the color changes that you were seeing on the, on the top of the pattern were the drill cuttings that were coming up off the drilling process. And, and those drill cuttings can add a totally different color to the bench surface um, that bring those, those colors out. Um, our next question is, uh, 
how do you attract the new generation to carry on the art of, of blasting explosives? Uh, loss of expertise is a serious problem across the industry and what can we do to change that? I think we reiterated on that quite a bit to begin with, but just to reiterate, you know, and it really takes a certain breed to do this work. It's not a nine to five job. You know, it's long hours. <clears throat> There's many days I've been out long for daylight and I'm sure Jared and Christy have too. I've been out long after dark, <clears throat> but the people that want to get in it, um, to bring them up properly, you know, train them properly and teach them the right way, the way we were taught. I I think there's a lot of construction trades, whether it's electrician, plumber, blasting industry are all searching for uh, young up and coming people to bring into the industry. Um, I think what blasting has to offer is, I mean, it's challenging. It's interesting. We are dealing with the high explosives. I mean, it's a, it's a cool job. I mean, we're not hooking up sewer lines and, 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 uh, you know, water lines. I mean, we're, we're literally handling explosives every day. So it, it is a fun and challenging job, especially the civil arena. That's why I like construction blasting is it's, you know, we've all talked about it. It's ever changing. We're not on a quarry bench drilling the same thing, blasting the same thing day after day. Uh, when we're on a pipeline, we're, you know, we're covering miles and miles uh, on a job. And so we're seeing different scenery different rock types uh the geology's changing so that's what i love about it um you know if a kid's coming out you know you don't necessarily have to go to school to excel in this industry i mean you get uh boots on the ground experience some of my best guys have never been to college they've got their working man's phd and really as an owner that's what i'm looking for uh you know we've got some smart people that uh, do have their mining engineering degree and they bring their own level of, of expertise but i've got some guys that have got 40 some years of experience and you just can't replace that true story true story i'll back that one up i yep. got some guys yes. that have had over 40 years experience and they're the guys i learned from and they've taught me the good bad and the best so mm -hmm. A lot of my best teachers taught me what not to do. And that's sometimes better than what to do. You know, make sure you don't do this. Make sure you don't do that. You know. Uh, our next question here is very much related to the topic we've had, uh, had and it's uh, for all of you, did your time in college or your field experience prepare you more for the workforce? And maybe the question is which prepared you more uh, for the workforce and what you do? Boots on the ground. Boots on the ground every day, all day. Um, college got me nothing, but, um, this is going to sound weird, but it taught me how to run a business, taught me a little bit of background on that side, um, a little bit of the engineering side. So you could pick out, you can nitpick. Um, other than that, it was boots on the ground explosives. It, it's not a science. It's a mix a true mix and that's what we love about it it's a mix of art and science and that's Thank what we roll on yeah and i mean i mean you know i'm presuming i'm graduate degree in explosives right now and it um uh, it, it helps to sometimes things that i've got some experience with maybe focus a little more on or get a little more in depth so i, I do expand my knowledge but it, it goes back to that boots on the ground doing it every day you know and like we were talking about in the last round those all those teachers you guys have been around a long time that, that are willing to teach and show us the right way. And that's what we're doing now for the next generation. Our next question is again for all of you. And uh, the question is what sort of explosives are used and what are the differences between them? And how do you choose? Oh, wow. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a deep subject. So how long, how long we got? Yeah. So, I mean, you basically can break them down to packaged in bulk um package come in a stick and then bulk you either pump or auger out of a truck so depending on the type of project what your local supplier has uh then you can break the package down into water gels emulsions dynamites uh there's certain times uh when we want a, pro a product that uh might not propagate like a, an emulsion. And then there's certain times that we may, you know, if it gets into a certain situation that it goes ahead and propagates. Um, so that is a deep subject that we could spend a long time talking about. The, all, there's so many different products nowadays. There's different manufacturers uh, from detonator types, uh, systems, 
Uh, but the explosives are ever changing. I mean, the manufacturers do a really good job of of uh, evolving uh, the gas emulsions to the sensitized emulsions. So um, that's one of the first things. That's one of the basic things when you design a shot is picking the type of explosives. Um, I mean, if you're in, you know, Hawaii and they only have bagged info, then that's what you got to use. Um, but you know, around here in the Midwest, we pretty much have pick of a litter, whatever, whatever it is we need, our explosive suppliers can get, but, um, you know, it's it, explosives are just a tool. Um, you know, my mechanics, they can't work on everything with just a crescent wrench. So sometimes they need a nine sixteenths wobble headed socket to do what they need to do. And explosives are the same way, whether it's detonating cord or pre-split powder or packaged emulsion, um, you know, we just pick the right tool for the job and that's part of it being a blaster. And that's part of what I love is, is setting up the jobs, you know, uh, picking the, po the explosives. Um, so yeah, that, that, there's a big selection out there nowadays. All right. Our next question is again, for all of you, uh, when you're blasting in areas of vibration limitation, do you perform test blasting to measure vibration intensity before performing larger blasts? Absolutely. I always do, yeah. or always, and I always <clears throat> get it. We get a <clears throat> get a reading to what we're looking at because all the geology can change. You know, it can be limestone, but like I said, it can be different colors without getting into geology. And, and in the way the vibra ground vibration moves can change, the way the structures are built. So I always get small test blasts first, get some real data there, and then work myself in. We can design shots and predict what the vibrations are going to be. Um, and get pretty accurate, but uh, we always say every shot's a test shot, and the first one's the most important. We want to back up the numbers. Most of the projects we do, we've got to put blasting plans in and and uh, show them the calculations and the numbers, and then we go ahead and prove it up um, with a test shot with you know seismic readings and and um, you know, and then we learn and grow off of that. You know, once the first shot's done, you can make uh, minor adjustments and tweak. And um, so, yeah, they're very important test shots. One of my favorite parts is I always when I go from the design phase to the actual shot phase to see how accurate I really am, how close I get. You know, I like on the vibration levels and things like That's that. That's always fun. Yeah. I love it. Your own regression yeah. analysis and everything else. Yeah, that's always a fun part. I mean, you take the same explosives in the same pattern and move a mile away, and the response to the site is different. Completely different. Not you can go across the street in some places up here, the changes. All right. Our next question is from Alex. Uh, to what extent do you use bore tracking equipment to determine the actual hole placement and accuracy of the drill or the driller? Depends on the job. Uh, very basic, a lot of times we use it on um, some really, really deep pits, or at least where I'm at, uh, we will, just to make sure we don't get into slurry walls. If you don't know what a slurry wall is, it's a concrete poured wall that, or versus your solid rock wall. Um, that's usually where we use it, but that's kind of locally us. Uh, we usually don't have to, because we don't drill over about 60 feet tops. So our drills are pretty accurate. Most of the civil blasting, you have to get into specialty projects before you break out the bore tracker. On a day-to-day -day job, our benches are not very tall or our holes aren't very deep. But I mean, we do specialty stuff, uh, line drilling, where you need to be super accurate. You break out the bore tracker and make sure your drillers are doing a good job on accuracy for final wall, because that has a lot to do with how much concrete they got to pour and all that stuff. So. Um, there is a time and a place for bore trackers. Mm. They are used more in the mining and underground, though, than we are in construction. It's, just, it's a different purpose. <clears throat> right, exactly. Usually, most of the time, we don't have to drill deep enough. Like I said, on occasion, you're in some deep pits or something like that. Um, and that's about it for the civil side, anyways. All right, our next question here is uh, from Eric, and it's for Jared. Uh, Jared, what was the biggest adjustment you have to make between civil blasting and what you learned in demolition blasting? Oh, gosh. Uh, they're two totally different arenas. Uh, different sets of explosives, um, different calculations, different mediums. I mean, 
Um, you're either dealing with concrete or steel in the demolition. Um, concrete, you kind of deal with powder factor like you do rock. Um, demolition blasting is more understanding of the structural analysis. You're just using explosives to um, let gravity do its job. Um, they're just two totally different different arenas. Um, the main thing that would be the, the concrete would be the most uh, um, uniform thing between the, the two demolition and rock. Uh, I really like blasting concrete because it's consistent medium uh, and it's mostly multifaceted. So there's sometimes four sides and a top where when a rock, rock face, you, you know, you got a free face and a top. So uh, G, uh, the drilling accuracy and hole placements is super important in drilling something like concrete. So, all right, we have a few minutes left here. Um, so if you have any other questions, please send them in. Um, our next question is from Spencer and it's uh, for all of you. Uh, do any of you have experience with deflagrating char cartridges and what are they? I have not. I know what they are, <clears throat> but I haven't done it. <clears throat> we don't use them. Jared? We, we, we've played around on a couple of jobs with deflagrating, deflagrating charges. Um, there's a time and a place for those, just like any product. Uh, basically, they're low order detonating and not, not high explosives. Um, um, you know, in really, really close in or where you can't get a blasting permit, sometimes they're used. Um, my thought is if we're going to go to the trouble of drilling a hole, I'm going to put some explosives in it. You know, you can get down to pre-split. We, we always tell people you can carve Mount Rushmore if you got enough time and money. I mean, there's, there's members of this society that are carving crazy horses. as we speak with explosives. I mean, it's pretty impressive what you can do if you have time. Um, so it's like any tool, you know, the defragating charges definitely have a place. Uh, we just don't have that much experience with it. If we're going to drill a hole, we're going to put a, um, you know, a calculated amount of high explosives in there to, to, to break the amount of rock that, that we're drilling. So I want to make sure you get the first time cost too much. Go back. I've got one last question um, for all of you here. And it's uh, what governmental agencies do you have to report to if you're in the explosives industry? And before the three of you chime in, I'll remind everybody <laughs> that a session coming up next week, uh, uh, talking exactly about reporting. Uh, but in your perspectives, Jared, Christy, and, and Brian, um, who do you have to report to? Jared, do you want to go first? Well, I mean, we can break it down from, let's start with a local level. So every city, one minute, here. one minute remaining, every city has their own ordinance. So some cities have blasting ordinance, some don't. Uh, then you go to the state level. There's uh, various state agencies. Sometimes it's the fire marshal's office. Sometimes in Oklahoma, it's the Department of Mines. Uh, Pennsylvania, it's the De Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, mm -hmm. And then from oh, a right. national level, you have the, you know, the ATF or the BATFE, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Farms, and Explosives. So, um, you know, and then transportation is the, uh, the Department of Transportation. So, there's a lot of different levels of agencies that are looking over our shoulder, like Brian alluded to earlier. Um, in OSHA. <laughs> yeah, OSHA. Yeah, we're, we're working in the mines. It's MSHA. <laughs> so a um, lot, of, lot of agencies looking over our shoulders is a blaster. And these are just the agencies in the U.S. And then we yeah. start talking about our international friends, and there's a lot more. Uh, so we're out of time for our question and answer session. I want to thank all of you online for uh, attending the first half of tonight's uh, uh, webinar. And I want to thank, thank our, uh, our, our, our panelists here, Jared, Brian, and Christy, for showing us how we use explosives in civil projects. So thanks, Travis. And thank you for watching this episode of the ISEE Explosives Everyday Series. Explosives are the ultimate power tool that help mine the minerals and materials that are used in creating many of the products and roadways we use each and every day. They help keep our towns and cities safe from avalanches. They are used to shape and improve the environment and also in military and demolition applications. And they're in some of our favorite TV shows, movies, sporting events and concerts. Our job as professionals in the explosive industry and at the ISEE is to ensure explosives continue to be handled and applied in the safest way possible and to continue to provide the resources and tools needed to help advance the science and art of explosive engineering. If you're interested in finding out more about the International Society of Explosive Engineers, please go to our website, ise.org, 
You'll find information about membership, our chapters around the world and other useful links including a calendar of upcoming events as well as conferences and meetings in our industry. Another great resource is the World of Explosives where you can find information on using explosives safely, the most frequently asked questions from homeowners about blasting, how blast vibrations affect structures and all the planning that goes into each blast. It's also home to Explosives the Power Tool this is a video series covering the history of explosives and the technical advancements that have been made possible because of them. To check it out, visit explosives.org. So a special thank you to this episode's sponsors, LDE Global, Dino Nobel, Opit Blast, Daikon Blasting Corporation and Sigicon. Before we go, I'd like to show a short piece from our series partners, Dino Nobel. Detit is proud to introduce the Differential Global Positioning Tagger as a new feature to the already market-leading DigiShot Plus 4G system. The process of tagging and hole identification is now made simpler with the Differential GPS sub 1 meter hole accuracy. This unique addition to the DigiShot Plus 4G system takes away any possibility of human error during the tagging process, making mining simpler, safer and smarter. You have to be very quiet and gentle. You are building a new subway and you don't want anyone to notice. It's a surprise. That's why you have monitors that pick up on everything. You monitor and measure vibration, air blast, noise, dust. Nothing escapes you. You can be halfway around the world and you still would notice every minor change here, right when it happens. People nearby don't notice anything, but you do. You make adjustments, so even less will be noticed in the next blast. What was that? A plane flying overhead. Small children playing. They're having fun. You blow up more of the rock, deep below the playground. Gently, quietly. It's a surprise after all. People appreciate you most when they can't see, hear, or feel you. The monitors show nothing. And that is everything. Infra, remote monitoring of construction sites. From Sigicom. So that's it for this episode of Explosives Every Day. If you like this content, be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube, Facebook and LinkedIn pages to stay up to date with all the latest ISE happenings. And be sure to check out all 10 of our episodes highlighting the different ways explosives are used around the world every day. On behalf of the ISEE, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.